Here are the sponsors for the video tour. Our diamond sponsors include Farm Credit Canada, Famucan Farms, Van Breek Farm Nursery. Gold sponsors include BSF, NM Bartlett, the Nova Scotia Crop and Livestock Insurance Commission, Paul Lanahan and RBC Dominion Securities, Scotian Gold, Truro Argomart, and V Cross Nurseries. Our silver sponsors include Bear Crop Science, Bishop and Company, Corteva AgriScience, Grindstone Creek Nursery, and Nova International Equipment. And our bronze sponsors include Cavendish Agri-Services, Eastern Drainage, Evans Manufacturing Company, Nova Scotia Farm Loan Board, Perennia, Provide Agro, TD Agriculture, Upper Canada Growers. And we also have a general sponsor, Adams County Nurseries. Now we're back here again and Dr. Suzanne Blatt is going to talk about some uh, research with uh, leaf rollers and apple leaf curling midge. Hi, I'm Susie Blatt. I'm an entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. There's two activities that I'm going to chat about today. One is the host volatiles who attract leaf rollers and the second is an apple leaf curling midge. And there's many collaborators involved with this work. The, this is a national project. So we'll start with the host volatiles. Several years ago, one of the researchers from AAFC in British Columbia, he was working with a colleague and they did, were looking at what compounds are produced when an apple tree is fed on by, uh, by a caterpillar. In this case, they were looking at eye spotted bud moth and they were using potted apple trees. And they found that there were a couple compounds that were specific that got produced once the tree was fed upon and that these were attractive to both males and females of different species of the same leaf roller or tortricid family in British Columbia. So I got involved with this work back in 2016 as part of an AAFC project and then we took it and the idea was to see if there's any regional differences, if there's going to be any uptake um, in these other areas. We have two very simple objectives. We wanted to test these two specific compounds on leaf roller populations in the apple producing areas of Canada and when their idea was of their potential for mass trapping and then we also wanted to look at acetic acid and the pear ester for additive effects because there had been some work done on these with respect to specific species of, of leaf roller but not with all of them. So the mass trapping concept it's a very simple one. You go into an orchard block and you basically heavily populate it with traps that are baited with something that's very attractive to the species, you know, one or multiple of interest. And the allure of these two host volatiles is that they have attraction to both males and females and that they were attractive to multiple species. So this could eliminate in those areas where you've got like a complex of leaf rollers, instead of having to put out multiple lures, you could put out one and then you'd be able to pull it in. So that was the end game if possible. But as, as you can imagine, there are definitely challenges because you do need to attract both males and females for mass trapping. You need to overcome all of the surrounding hosts that are also putting out sometimes these same volatiles because they've got some of the leaf rollers feeding upon them. And then there's the cost. What is it when you commercialize these compounds? What do the traps cost? How often do you have to change them? All of those things factor in to whether or not you're going to be able to use mass trapping as a management technique. A sex pheromone, which is commonly used when you're monitoring, is only capturing the male of the species. And really, if that male has managed to mate before they ended up in the sex pheromone trap, then you've already got your damage potential is already out there because the female still has the ability to go and lay her eggs and the little babies will go and damage your trees. So that's one benefit of something that will attract both males and females is you're taking you're taking out both of them. Um, in our studies, we were working uh, with the company Trace, uh, which is located out on the Western United States. And we're using a Delta One trap or what they, what Trace calls is their Farrakhan 6. And the lures that we were using um, in the center panel, you can see the bubble caps that they're, they're just hung in the trap. And um, underneath that, you put a sticky liner. 
if you were going to be capturing for mass trapping, you'd want not a sticky liner, you would want a trap that can capture a large volume of moths. But for our purposes, just to show proof of concept, we were using the sticky traps. On the top right hand corner, that's what the trap looks like when it's hanging in the orchard. And it's got two little bubble caps. So if you look at the bottom left panel there where it's got the big red and then the smaller white, those are the bubble caps that they um, decided to go with. Now they played around with using these compounds in vials that had a little hole punched in the top. They played around with them in little rubber septa, which is more commonly used for uh, sex pheromones. But they decided that bubble caps give the best release rates. And so the big large red one there has a higher release rate. It's got a larger surface area that the compound is coming out. And so it has a higher concentration coming out at any one time compared to the smaller little guy. In the middle on the bottom, I put a little comparative shot there between the oblique banded leaf roller, which is on the right, and the eye spotted bud moth, which is on the, the left. And other, you know, leaf roller species like your red banded and your lesser apple worm are even smaller than the eye spotted. And there's just a close up shot there through the microscope of what your eye spotted bud moth looks like. In Nova Scotia, we've got eight different species of this uh, leaf roller family. Not all of them um, affect any type of damage that we can specifically attribute to that species, but the main ones that we do wor look at and worry about, um, the eye spotted bud moth, coddling moth, oblique banded leaf roller, oriental fruit moth, off and on. The ones on the right are also present. Um, red banded and lesser apple worm are actually present in huge numbers, but we've never been able to, you know, connect those directly to, to any damage within the orchard. And so one thing we wanted to know was how attractive these compounds are to the different species. So um, on that previous slide, we showed that there were eight different species. And when you go into the field with um, the, two, the two compounds, and they're just abbreviated as BN and PET, so benzyl cyanide, phenyl ethanol, um, you can look up the structures if you really want to, um, but AA refers to acetic acid. When you do these trials without the acetic acid, the captures are really, really low. So the acetic acid is definitely needed as that synergist it, it, and to pull them in. And the first thing that we discovered is that not every species really cares about these host volatiles or even the acetic acid. So on the top panel there, you're showing like but eye spotted bud moth um, is heavily attracted, which makes a lot of sense because the these compounds were identified from apple trees that were fed on by eye spotted bud moth. So my curiosity is what would those volatiles profiles be if it were lesser apple worm that was doing the feeding or oblique banded leaf roller that was doing the feeding. So, but that's research for another day. Um, oblique banded does respond to these, but differently. So if you're looking at the eye spotted, that not large red bar is your benzyl cyanide and over on the oblique banded, it tends to like the phenyl ethanol. So the idea that just one compound is going to be, you know, pulling in all of your species we're kind of struggling with that notion. Um, lesser apple worm, uh, red banded, or the gray tortrix all seem to be, you know, equally attracted to all of them. Um, and lesser apple worm gets totally confused and can show up in the controls. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions that Michelle wanted me to cover was, are we seeing any regional differences? If you look at the numbers that we're getting in Nova Scotia on the side there, we're into, you know, 10, 15 for eye spotted bud moth, and then down around five, on average, five moths. And this is per site, so per replicate, with a lot of variation. The lines that are within the bars are showing the variation in those numbers. From Quebec, they've just started looking at these host volatiles last year. And their two species of interest are oblique bandit and coddling moth. Um, and you'll notice that coddling moth does not appear in that top graph because the numbers with just those compounds are really, really low. And the difference between what they're finding in Quebec and what we're finding is their numbers, even with the same species, are also very, very low. And whether that's a, a regional difference or whether that's because their populations are lower, we still have to tease that part out. With that acetic acid, we looked at two different release rates. So the small bubble cap gave us a low release rate and that big red bubble cap gave us a high release rate. And what we looked at here with red banded didn't really seem to be a big difference. 
but your eye spotted really likes the higher level of the acetic acid. Oblique banded, conversely, likes the low level. So in terms of which synergist you want to put out in the orchard, it looks like there could be some issues even trying to pair that up so that you're going to get multiple species, which is not exactly what we were hopeful for. But not to be left out, I wanted to show, this is work that we did, uh, a trial we did last year. So high acetic acid, low acetic acid, um, the combo of the two host volatiles with high and low, but then we also put the pear ester in there. And pear ester is a compound that has been shown to have attraction for codling moth. And what we were able to demonstrate that in Nova Scotia, yes, if we put pear ester out there, then codling moth starts showing up at these traps. And if we don't have pear ester in the mix, it shows up at very low levels. So we know that, that codling moth likes pear ester. Um, I spotted bud moth doesn't really care about pear ester so much. It's more interested in the acetic acid that is out there. There was work done in, I think it was New York, where they were looking at using pear ester as part of a mass trapping for codling moth. And the numbers that they were pulling in were much higher than the numbers that we are pulling in with codling moth. Now we're in sites that I know have solid populations of eye spotted and codling moth and we're getting low numbers. So I'm suspicious that we do have some regional differences between how these populations are responding to these same compounds. In British Columbia, because a lot of the baseline um, information, they know which species are attracted, they know which ones they're um, keen to try to use the, these products for. And so they're moved on to uh, the using them in a perimeter trapping. And this is a situation that appears in British Columbia more commonly than I think here in Nova Scotia. This is where they will have a cherry block, which is nearby a very young apple planting. And what they want to do is oblique banded will feed on both of these crops. And oftentimes the first flight comes out in cherry and then the second flight will move over into the apple and cause damage later in the season. So what we wanted to try was baiting up our traps, um, the blue X's there, with the host volatiles, spacing them fairly close together, and then comparing that with a, a different part of the perimeter where we had no traps put in. Into the apple block, we would put some pheromone traps. So now we're able to watch and determine what has made it through the perimeter, and then we're going to look at the damaged fruit. They tried this first last year in 2019, and their populations were not high enough that we could say anything. Uh, this year, they've repeated it, and it seems to be going a lot better. 2020 is the first year in Ontario that they are testing these host volatiles. So after this year, we'll have a complete picture from Nova Scotia, Quebec, and Ontario about what species, as well as how they are um, attractive to these host volatiles. In Quebec, they're working on the next phase. So they're adding the high release acetic acid. And because they're interested in codling moth, they're playing around with the pear ester. And we're doing the repeat perimeter trial in British Columbia. So once we get all of that data, then we'll have in 2021, um, another set of experiments. And the last year will be in 2022. And at the end of that, we will hopefully have a solid understanding of where these host volatiles may or may not be of use um, and against which species. The second part or second activity within this uh, cluster has to do with leaf curling midge. And so this critter is a, it's a consistent pest in some orchards. And we're thinking that that has something to do with uh, the moisture levels, how hard that ground is. They emerge from the ground right underneath the apple tree. They're not great flyers. They're very fragile little critters. And so they basically just move up into the tree straight up. <laughs> they don't go between trees. So what's under your tree is pretty much in your tree. And so it has to do with the ground cover that's there and the availability of new growth. In the mid 90s, Nova Scotia brought in a parasitoid, I believe from New Zealand. And that has been able to affect maybe like 20% parasitism, but again, but that's not enough to knock down the populations that we see in some orchards. Um, in some areas such as uh, Ontario and BC, there was a real interest in developing a growing degree day model. They wanted to know when the adults were out there, when that population was growing, so they could better time their sprays. We are observing a connection between 
uh, growers that use softer products or who aren't spraying as, as frequently, um, and they tend to have more of an issue with leaf curly midge. It also has to do with varieties of the apples and what, how old those trees are. There's a lot of factors that play into whether or not you're going to have a leaf curly midge issue. So a degree day model is just a way to standardize um, the amount of heat or temperature that is occurring between areas. If we look at that graph for just a minute, that first, um, that first straight up line that goes up to 100, that's your first generation. The second, the second line, set of lines going from 100 to 200, that's your second generation. And then the top set is going to, your, that's your third generation. So we definitely see three generations in Nova Scotia. I put the four sites of Nova Scotia and one from Ontario, just so the graph doesn't get too cluttered. If you were to do these by calendar day, Ontario would be a couple weeks ahead. But when you account for the temperatures, it brings them much closer. They're still ahead of us. What we need to do in order to generate these curves and to refine what heat units are necessary to get that population pushed is we need to have that data at frequent intervals. So we'll be checking the traps uh, two to three times a week and we need multiple sites over multiple years to generate these curves with any consistency because you need that variation. Some years are, are quick to heat up, some years are dragged out. So the, the ability to have all of those contingencies wrapped up into your model makes that model more robust and more effective for the grower to use. We've discovered that a model for each region is needed. Um, British Columbia, they are way ahead when they start to see leaf curly midge their first flight. Ontario and Quebec are very close together. Um, we, Nova Scotia, we're also unique in when we come out and we're slower to get started, but then we kind of mesh with the second and third generations are similar to Ontario and Quebec, but our first generation is a little bit later. And it is important to know that because that first generation is the one that kicks off what happens down the road in your growing season with your second and third. So if you can get that first generation under control, you've got a hope of having much less impact second and third. Uh, this is the final year of data for that project. Uh, the preliminary models have been developed and we anticipate having models rolled out to each region and then ready for you know, verification and validation and to actually be used by some growers just and to get that feedback on how they are working by 2021.